Hello, and welcome to this video podcast for human genetics. This will be the first podcast of three that deals with matters of sex and genetics. Over the next two or three podcasts, I think it'll be three in total, we're going to cover some fairly broad topics. We're going to start off with sexual development and identity. We'll also talk about X-linked and Y-linked traits. In doing so, we'll compare and contrast the X and Y chromosomes, but we'll also look at pedigrees. We'll look at pedigrees showing X-linked traits and pedigrees showing Y-linked traits. We'll also bring up two additional extensions to Mendel's rules, and these are sex-limited and sex-influenced traits. We'll spend some time talking about X inactivation. And finally, genomic imprinting. But let's go ahead and get started with sexual development. All right, so before we get started on sexual development, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about sexual identity. And we can interpret sexual identity at different levels. We can think about it at the chromosomal level. Or we can think about it at the genetic level. We could think about sexual identity at the gonadal sex level. We could think about it at the phenotypic sex level. The gender identity level. And sexual orientation. And let's think about the events that explain these levels. At the chromosomal genetic level, XX typically equals female sex, and then XY typically indicates male sex. Gonadal sex, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit. This is when a undifferentiated gonad develops into either an ovary or testes. Phenotypic sex, we would define this as the development of internal and external sex organs. And typically, this is in response to hormones. Gender identity. Up to this point, I've been using the word sex and not the word gender. In a general sense, the word sex means the biological difference between males and females, such as XX versus XY, having ovaries or testes, developing external or internal male or female sexual organs. The difference is largely genetics, anatomical, or physiological. It tends to be more binary, male or female. Now, gender is not binary. I'm going to just draw a line here so we don't get the different descriptions mixed up here. It's not binary. It's much more fluid. It's a strong and real feeling of being male or female. Sexual orientation. This is the attraction to the same or opposite sex. And we'll talk more in detail about sexual orientation in a little bit. I'd also like to think about the timing of these different levels. So for chromosomal or genetic sex, that's determined at fertilization. Gonadal sex, when that undifferentiated gonad becomes an ovary or a testes, that occurs at six weeks post-fertilization. I'm going to abbreviate fertilization here. Now, the development of internal and external sex organs. Now, this starts at about eight weeks post-fertilization. 
and then again it's completes at puberty gender identity this starts from childhood maybe earlier There are some studies that suggest that gender identity could begin in utero while the embryo or fetus is developing. Same with sexual orientation. That's also from childhood. And I'll also say maybe earlier. Some evidence suggesting that sexual orientation could be determined at an earlier state, such as during embryonic or fetal development. What we're going to do now is we're going to start talking about sexual development. And talking about sexual development, we'll talk about many of these in more detail. I suspect most of you already know if someone is XX that at the genetic level they are female. We'll talk about some exceptions to that. And we also know if someone is born with an X and Y chromosome that they are typically male. There are some, again, some exceptions to that that we'll talk about. But what is it about these chromosomes that help determine or help develop a fertilized egg into a male or female? Early in sexual development, the structures, the sex structures we have, we would call the indifferent stage. And at the indifferent stage, what the embryo has are two undifferentiated gonads. They have the potential to become testes or ovaries. In addition to these undifferentiated gonads, we also have some ducts that are forming. In fact, we have two pairs of ducts. The ones I drew here in green, these are the Wolfian ducts. And the ones in blue here are the Mullerian ducts. Someone who is XY, they have this gene called SRY. We'll talk more about that later, but if this were the Y chromosome, one of those genes on it is the SRY gene. And what the SRY gene does is it will initiate a pathway that produces testosterone. So an individual who's XY, what happens, let's draw it like this, XY, which means plus SRY, because it's on the Y chromosome, these undifferentiated gonads will develop into testes. The Wolfian ducts here, when SRY is present, will persist. So we still have the Wolfian ducts. However, the Mullerian ducts, the ones here in blue on the outside, they will degrade. So I won't even draw them down here because they're going to degrade. Now, in the case of testes, what happens, I'm going to erase this so I can redraw it, is as the testes develop, they will descend. And the Wolfian ducts will mature into the ductus deferens. Which will be the tubes that are used to export the sperm. You should also label the testes. Okay, now let's think about an individual who is XX. And so that means no SRY gene because there's no Y chromosome. XX individual, no SRY gene. No SRY gene, the production of testosterone is not stimulated. The undifferentiated gonads will differentiate into ovaries. These Mullerian ducts up here, these blue ones, they will persist. And the Wolfian ducts will degrade. Unlike testes differentiation, the ovaries don't drop. They stay inside the body cavity. And then these Mullerian ducts become the uterine tubes. Some of you may have learned these as being called the fallopian tubes. We usually just call them uterine tubes now. So that's what I'll call them. And these are the uterine tubes that will collect 
the oocytes as they develop and deliver them down into the uterus. And then if fertilization, successful fertilization occurs, it's going to happen up here early in the early part of the uterine tubes so that when it gets down to the uterus, it can implant properly. I didn't say it, but I should have. For the most part, they stay this undifferentiated state until the sixth week. At the sixth week, that's when they will start to develop or differentiate these gonads into ovaries or, or testes. Prior to that sixth week, they're still XX or XY, so they're still male or female. It's just that they haven't developed these sexual organs yet. So we know that this SRY gene is important in male development. And it is indeed still very important, but I also want to stress that there are other genes as well. So I'm going to just say plus other genes. You don't need to know them specifically, but you should know that it's not just one gene that's important to make the undifferentiated gonads into testes. When I learned this many years ago, we I was taught that going from the undifferentiated state to the ovaries was this default pathway that if nothing happened because there's no SRY or no testosterone, the baby would just develop into a female. Well, it's not that simple and we shouldn't make it that simple because we know that it's not just by chance since SRY is not there that they become female. It's because of genes, other genes, plus the lack of SRY. What's important for XX individuals to become female is still the fact, we can't get rid of this fact, there's no SRY gene. But, and I'll put plus, other genes that are present and expressed in the female. One of these genes is called WNT4, and I'll call it WNT4. Exactly what WNT4 does, we're not 100% sure, but we do know that if WNT4 is mutated, so let's just write that up here, a WNT4 mutation, it does affect development of females. Individuals with a mutation in WNT4 will have high levels of testosterone. They will not have a vaginal canal and not have a uterus and ovaries poorly develop and I'm running out of room here but I'm going to try to squeeze it in here don't develop secondary sex characteristics secondary sex characteristics are characteristics that are not directly linked to sexual reproduction but they do typically appear around the time of puberty. So in humans, that would include pubic hair, growth of breasts, and widening of the hips for females. It would also include facial hair and the development or the, the growth of the Adam's apple in males. So these secondary sex characteristics in individuals with a mutated WNT4 will not develop. So what I'd like to do now is talk about the X and Y chromosomes in a little bit more detail. For starters, let's draw the X chromosome like this, and we'll draw the Y chromosome like this. So this is our X chromosome, and this is our Y chromosome. As you can see the way I drew them, the X chromosome is huge. It's a very large chromosome. Since the X chromosome is quite a bit larger, it's not surprising then to find out that it contains approximately 800 genes, while the Y chromosome, rather embarrassingly, only contains about 70 genes. The X chromosome has many of these 800, many of them are very important for the health and well-being of an individual. There are some interesting genes on the Y chromosome, but the majority of those genes are male sex determining genes. like the SRY. Some of the other genes are important in bone development, tooth development, ear development, and some involved in the cell cycle. The X chromosome genes, some of its genes that have claimed some notoriety, include the colorblind gene, muscular dystrophy gene is located on the X chromosome, and hemophilia. Lots of other really important genes. Interestingly, the Y chromosome used to be an X chromosome. 
And we know that because on the X on the Y chromosome, about 10 to 15 percent of it is identical or close to identical to the X chromosome. It turns out that the Y chromosome over the millions of years has shrunk and it continues to shrink. If it used to be an X chromosome, you can see that it's lost over 700 of its genes. It's estimated that in approximately 4.6 million years, the Y chromosome will just be gone. So that's the sad news. The good news is there's a good chance everybody watching this video won't see that happen. So the question always comes up is will that, will that mean that males will no longer exist? I don't know, but it does seem likely that males would still continue to exist. We know that since this Y chromosome used to be an X chromosome, what happened to all those genes? Well, those genes just ended up moving over to the other X chromosome or to other autosomes. And what's left here are just the genes that haven't moved yet. So it's possible that the rest of these genes will just move over to another chromosome, the X or an autosome, and continue to have the function of causing male sexual development. There is one example of how this could happen, and that is the mole vole species. The mole vole is a mammal that lacks a Y chromosome, yet they still produce males and females. We'll just have to wait and see what happens in about four and a half million years. Let's now move on to saying a few other things about the X and the Y chromosome. Okay, I should have probably mentioned this on the last whiteboard, but I wanted to define two terms that you should know. The first is homogametic, and the second is heterogametic. This just refers to which sex chromosome pairs the individual has. In humans, the homogametic sex is the XX individual, who are typically female. Homo for the same, gametic for the sex chromosomes. Heterogametic is XY, who are typically males in humans. Hetero for different, so different sex chromosomes, and gametic for the sex chromosomes. Well, this seems like a good place to end this first podcast on sex and genetics. In this podcast, we talked about the different levels of sexual identity. We also talked briefly about how sexual development occurs from the undifferentiated gonads to either the ovaries or the testes. We also spent a little time talking about the X and Y chromosomes, comparing them, their size and the number of genes on them. And we closed with the definitions of homogametic and heterogametic sexes. On the next podcast, we'll talk a little bit more about the sex chromosomes. We'll talk about how an XX individual isn't always female. Sometimes they can be male. And we'll talk about how an XY individual isn't always male. They can also develop as females. We'll talk about a couple of different syndromes associated with that. We'll also talk about the genetic evidence of homosexuality. And we'll talk about sex ratios. If you have any questions at all over this material, please make sure you contact me. If not, I'll see you on the next podcast. Bye for now.